So I invite you to think with me for a minute this morning about first things. First things. As you think back in your life, can, can you remember the very, what's the thing that you can remember about your life from the very first? If you look back in the history of your journey, what's, what's the very first thing you can remember about your life? First thing. If you have children, can you remember your children's first words? What were the first things that they said? For our son, one of the first words he said was peas. P-E-A-S. Peas. Everything for a while was peas. Oatmeal was peas. The bottle was peas. Everything was peas. Do you remember the first words that your children said? Do you remember your first car? Do you remember your first crush? Do you remember the first A you got on a test? Oh, some of you haven't got there yet. <laughs> okay. Okay. Do you, remember, do you remember your first boyfriend? Your first girlfriend? Do you remember your first house? Do you, do you remember your first job? Do you remember the very first time you really felt like you loved somebody? Do you remember the first things? I have two first things up here this morning that I brought to show you. This is the manuscript of the very first sermon I ever preached. It is dated the 27th of November, 1977. I was 15 years old. It is the complete manuscript, and it has on the back... Chuck and Carolyn, the comments of Rand Edwards, my pastor at the time, who said, you might want to change a few things. <laughs> my very first sermon ever preached. And this one is the manuscript of the very first sermon that I preached as a pastor. November, or March the 18th, 1984. I was, at this time, 21 years old. It has some comments in it, too. Most of the comments are mine. Uh, you might want to throw this part out the next time you use this sermon. You might need to rework this one if you preach this particular section again. But nonetheless, my children, at some point in time, when I'm singing with Jesus, will take a look at these two and remember my first sermon. It intrigues me that in the section of Scripture that Mary Lee read for us, Matthew gives us a portion of the first sermon, at least in his gospel, that, Math that Jesus preaches. And my guess is that, Je that Matthew gives us the heart of that sermon. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near. I want to unpack that part of the first sermon that Jesus preached a little bit this morning. I want to start at the end of it instead of at the beginning of it. Repent, for the kingdom of heaven has come near, Jesus said. That last phrase, has come near, can also be translated, is at hand. So that phrase could read, the kingdom of heaven has come near, or the kingdom of heaven is at hand. However you translate it, what does it tell you about where the kingdom of heaven is? Come on. It's here. It's present. It's right where we are. Jesus says the kingdom of heaven is right here now. Now, let's think a little bit about that phrase, kingdom of heaven. The word kingdom is basileia. It means the royal dominion of someone or something. It isn't so much a place as much as it is life with a particular sovereign, a particular king or queen in charge. So in this case, the kingdom of heaven, heaven, by the way, is the abode of God, the place where God dwells, according to the Greek. So get the image. 
The place where God dwells, the place where God is in charge is right here, right now, Jesus says. Are you with me? Have you tracked with me? Now, look what Jesus says we are to do in response to the kingdom of heaven, the, 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 the place where God is in charge that's right here with us now. What are we to do in response to that? Did you catch it? What is the word? Repent. We are called to repent in, as we are confronted with the very real, right here, right now, reality of God in charge. We are called to repent. So that's Jesus' first sermon. Now imagine this. He steps up to the pulpit in Capernaum. And he, he takes the pulpit and he speaks to a group of people. By the way, the scripture does not identify who those people are. The scripture doesn't say they are Jews. Doesn't say that they're even Gentiles. It doesn't even give us an indication that when Jesus preaches this sermon, he is anywhere close to a synagogue. It just says that Jesus begins to preach, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. So imagine that he steps up to the pulpit in Capernaum and he, he takes a hold of it like a good preacher and he looks out across the congregation of people that he has never met before and the very first thing he says to this group of people is, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Wow, that's pretty bold. You know what the title of my very first sermon was as a preacher? The title was, Let's Be Friends. I, I kid you not. That's what it says. Let's be friends. And I'll read you the very last part of it. I wrote, so let's be friends. I want to be your friend. Jesus Christ wants to be your friend. And I pray that you will open your hearts and let us be friends together. That was my very first sermon. Some of these things are going to have to go up in smoke someday. But now imagine, why would I say that? Imagine if J David Jans, on the very first Sunday of July in the year 2007, stepped up to the pulpit at Christ Church in Franklin, Pennsylvania, and said to a group of people he had never met before, the very first things out of his mouth were, repent, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. How do you think the last 10 years would have gone? Well, when I first started to preach, for me, it was all about the fact that I wanted to be, wanted to be friends. Why? Because I, 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 I want you to like me. <laughs> and I wanted them to like me. But as I've gotten older, I've discovered that, you know what, it isn't about whether you like me or not. It's whether or not somehow, through what we share together in this place, Jesus Christ is lifted up and you're invited into relationship with him. And Jesus knew that. Jesus knew that what this group of people, whether he knew them or not, what they needed most was to recognize that in Jesus Christ, life with God in charge had come among them. And because of that, the primary response is a response of repentance. Now, the word repent in Greek is metanoia. And that particular word means in the Greek way of thinking to change direction. It's to change one's mind. If you're thinking about this, then think about this over here instead. That's to repent. In the Hebrew understanding of repentance, it literally has an action tied to it. It's to turn. In the Hebrew understanding of, of repentance, if you're headed this direction, to repent means that you turn and you go another direction. That's the idea. So when you put those together, repent, Change your orientation of life. Change the way you're thinking. Turn away from where you've been headed toward the place where God wants you to go. When you put those two together, Jesus is saying, look, I am here, and that means life with God in charge is among you. And because of that, take a look at your life and determine the places where you are headed away from God and change directions and head toward God. 
I, I started to share an image last week that has just been working with me this coming week. It occurs to me that what Jesus knows that we don't always think about is that there is a distance between where we are currently and where Jesus wants us to be. You get that? We are not now, none of us, including your pastor, exactly where Jesus wants us to be. That there is a distance between where we are and where Jesus wants us to be. And the business of repentance invites Jesus Christ into that space between where we are and where he wants us to be and invites Jesus Christ to work with that space to get the roadblocks out of the way, to pull down the walls, to deal with the things that we have set up that he's got to get through for us to get to where Jesus wants us to be. And by the way, where is it that Jesus wants us to be? What is the goal that Jesus wants to take us to? He wants us to be like him. He wants us to be like him. The reason that he is present in our life, the reason that he is working in the lives of people is so that he can help us get to be more and more like him in the world. Why? Because Jesus Christ knows that what the world needs more than anything is the presence and the power in the way of Jesus. And the way that gets shared with the world is through you and me. Are are you out there? Can I proclaim some good news to you today? You ready? Here's the good news. We serve a risen Savior. And the good news about the fact that we serve a risen Savior is that that one is here with us now in the power of the Spirit. So guess what? That means that the kingdom of heaven has come near to you and to me today. Right here, right now. And guess what Jesus Christ invites you and me to do in response to that? Repent. Invite Jesus Christ into the space that exists between where we are and where Jesus wants us to be. And invite him into that place so that the changes that he makes there will will get into all of the other places of our life and help us to to take those steps toward what he wants us to be. Now, let me be clear. Why is it that Jesus Christ wants us to be like him? Why is it that he wants us to journey from where we are to that place where he wants us to be? Does he want us to get there so that we, because we're afraid if we don't, somehow God won't care about us. Somehow God won't respond to us. He doesn't want us to go there because we're afraid of what will happen if we don't. He wants us to go there because God has got in his mind a clear picture of what your life can be fully surrendered to Jesus Christ. Woo! Come on now. Jesus knows what you can be. Jesus pictures what he wants you to be. And Jesus died on the cross so we could get there. And the work of repentance is allowing Jesus Christ to deal with the stuff that's in between where we are and where he wants us to be so that we can get there. That's the business of repentance, a willingness to let the Spirit work in our lives and probe us. It's, it's a little like this. I want, you to, I want you to imagine something with me, okay? So I've just been a little loud. Take a deep breath. Now, I want you to imagine that you're sitting in a chair alongside of a lake that is absolutely, perfectly still. Do you have the picture in your mind? It is a beautiful moment. There is little sound. It's quiet. You are at peace. You're just in the moment. You hear a car pull up behind you, and the door opens, and out jumps two rambunctious four year olds. Has your situation changed? And one of those four-year-olds makes his way up to the shore of the lake where you are and takes a stone and throws it in. What happens? Remember the condition of the lake, by the way. What happens? Uh huh. Where do the ripples go? To the other side of the lake even. 
How big does the stone have to be? Not very. Keep the image in mind. A choice to repent. A choice to allow Jesus Christ into the places between where we are and where he wants us to be is like throwing a stone in the lake. It ripples into all the different dimensions of who we are and begins to transform us. Now, I I can't know, friends, what's in between where you are and where God wants to take you. I, I, I can't know the specifics of what's there. I, I have some ideas of, of the fact that we share some things in common. One of the things that could easily be between where we are and where Jesus wants us to be for all of us is that we have a proclivity towards selfishness. Are you out there? We can be selfish people, can we not? Oh, come on now. Can we not? We can, we can want our own way. We can say with all the energy in us, I'm right, which means that you are. Uh-huh. We, we, we probably share some of that in common. We, we, we probably share some, a bit in common about the fact that we tend to want to manage and manipulate our circumstances ourselves before we surrender them to God. Are you out there? Am I the only one? We, 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 tend, we probably share that in common. And that's probably in that gap between where we are and where God wants to take us for all of us. But then I think there may be some other things in there for you that may be unique to your journey. Things like some type of sinfulness, a place where you are willingly choosing to live outside the will of God. What's that look like? Adultery, lying, cheating. Sinfulness could be there. There there could be addiction somewhere between where you are and where Jesus wants to take you. You you could be a slave to a substance that has more control over you than God does. You you might be in there somewhere uh, a slave to, to any number of things, I suppose, I can't know that, but what I, what I can know and what I do know is that the invitation for you and for me, whatever we identify that's in between the place where we are and the place where Jesus wants to take us, whatever that is, I want you to understand that Jesus Christ invites you and me to let him into that place no matter what. He invites us to let him into whatever that place is like. Have you stayed with me? D- 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 whatever that place is includes, the invitation is the same. Let Jesus Christ in to change you. Is it safe to say that it's been a tumultuous couple days for America? Is it safe to say? We have a new president this morning. You know that? From the last time we gathered? And whether you voted Democrat or Republican, whether you voted for Trump or against Trump, whether you voted for Mickey Mouse, it doesn't matter. Donald Trump is our president. And by the way, let's be clear about the call of Romans 13. The call of Romans 13 is we are to pray. For whoever is in leadership, the call of God's people is to pray for those folk. Now, it occurs to me that there there are some pretty strong feelings on both sides of this aisle, wouldn't you say? There are some people who really believe that the, 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 the nation went dark on Friday. And other people believe that that the light came on for America on Friday. Can I suggest to you, I wonder, if Jesus Christ were to walk up to the pulpit of America and preach a sermon, what would he say? What do you suppose he'd say? What would he say to America today? Do you suppose he would turn and say, now all of you who are Democrats, stand up. I have a message for you. And he would launch his message. Yeah, now you all sit down. Now all of you who are Republican, you stand up. I have a message for you. And Jesus would launch his message to the Republicans. 
They said, now all of you sit down. Now all the rest of you, which might be the bigger group, who voted for Mickey Mouse, stand up. I have a message for you. Are you with me? Do you think that Jesus would target that, like that? Or do you think that Jesus might step up to the pulpit and look out at this group of people, none of which he knows, but all of which fall under the lordship that he is? Do you suppose he would say to everybody, repent? For the kingdom of heaven has come near. Do you suppose? Do you suppose the message would be the same? Whether you're Democrat or Republican, pro-Trump, against Trump, Mickey Mouse, whatever you're about, let me into that space between where you are and where you can be and let me show you some things that need to get fixed so that you can be in step with what God wants to do in your life. How many of you ever marched in something? You ever marched in something in your life? Come on, wake up now. Come on, I know it's almost noon. We're gonna be done in six hours, I promise. Okay, if you've marched in something, military, band, something like that, stick up your hands, stick them up high, okay? You marched in something, all right, good. Now, you know that when you march in an organization like that, there's something rather important about marching in a group, and it is you got to stay in step. The key about an organization, the power of an organization coming down the street, wherever it is, is that it all functions as one. Those of you in the military, you know what it sounds like, right? To the left. Okay, you all know about that, okay? All right, now you want to stay in step for a couple of reasons. Number one, you don't want to look like a fool. Number two, you don't want to get run over from somebody beside you or behind you because you're out of step. Number three, you don't want to make the band director mad. Our band director was a guy named J. Marks Valine. He was about that tall. We called him Sugar Bear. And he had a fury about him that when you lit that fuse, it was like a star going. You didn't want to make that man mad. So you wanted to try to stay in step. Stay with the image with me, okay? To repent is to invite Jesus Christ to help you get back in step with what God is doing in your life. To invite Jesus Christ into the space between where you are and where God wants to take you is to allow him to invite, to look at the places in your life where you're out of step and say, don't you think we ought to do something about that? What if we thought about this? What if we cared for that in this way and invites you back into step so we can get where God wants us to be? Sisters and brothers, what the world needs is a church completely in step with Jesus Christ. That's what the world needs. That's what our community needs. <laughs> and that's what Sam and I want for us, to be in step. So I'm, I was thinking about a way to help you remember this. And the reason I was thinking about that is because I, I'm convinced that you hear me say this in some form Sunday by Sunday. And, and you nod and you smile and every once in a while you clap if you think it's, it's okay to do that. And, and, and you affirm it and then you walk out the door and it's like you never heard it before. You set it aside. And then you come back in the room seven days later. Oh, yeah, okay, I remember us talking about that. You, you with me? One of the reasons why there's a distance between where we are and where Jesus Christ wants us to be is because we don't take the time to apply spiritual truth. We just let it circle us out there somewhere, and we don't let it get down deep in us so that it can begin to change us. That's one of the reasons. So I was trying to think about how do I help you remember that the kingdom of heaven is at hand and the invitation that it brings is to repent. And I remembered a story that I wrote down in my journal. I told you a couple last week that I was in the hospital in May of 2016. I was first in a room all by myself, which is just fine with me. But then they wanted to paint that room. And so they moved me from there into another room, and I had a roommate this time. His name was Fred Baker. I discovered that he was a member of the Pilgrim Holiness Church up here in Rocky Grove. And that caused us to talk a little bit about our journey and the faith journey and the presence of Jesus in life. And he got excited about the fact that even though he couldn't see, he, had, he couldn't read because his, his eyesight was bad, 
He said, but he had the Bible on audio CDs. And every morning, his ritual was to get up and get his coffee and sit down at the table and play a portion of the Bible on CD. And he got really excited when he, did, when he said, I just found out before I came in here that James Earl Jones has recorded the Bible on audio CD. He said, I, I told my wife, I want a copy of that. We talked a bit more about his family, talked a bit more about his wife. They'd been married 55 years at the time. And then he began to talk about his illnesses. He began to talk about how hard it was with the various things that were wrong with him. And to be honest, I can't remember exactly what those were beyond the fact that he was legally blind. But he was sick. And the more we talked, the more he spiraled down into a dark place. Do do you get that? Whether it's you talking and spiraling or whether you're with someone else that talks and they spiral down into a dark place. He he got down into a dark place. And then all of a sudden, my bed was beside the door. All of a sudden, a person came in the room. And and it was a person that that was walking with a walker. And she was kind of bent over. And she walked very, very slowly and purposefully behind the walker. And, And she came past me. And, and kind of got within Fred's ability with his eyesight to see who it was. And when he caught a glimpse of her, he lit up like he had walked into a dark room and flipped the switch. He lit up. And he said, and I wrote it down verbatim, there's my beautiful bride. Now get the image. A man sick, very sick, legally blind. His bride of 55 years who struggles to walk, walks in. He catches glimpse of her and lights up. I'm going to tell you what, they did something right in marriage for that to still happen. But as I thought about that, I thought about the fact that what made the difference for Fred was that his wife had walked through the door into his space. It was her presence where he was that changed his whole experience. Can I encourage you to think this week about the number of times you walk in and out of a doorway? Think about the number of doorways that you've walked in and out of already today. Somebody came past me after the second service and just looked at me and said, 18. (laughs) Been through 18 doorways. Can I encourage you that when you walk in and out of a doorway this week, let the walking in and out of the doorway trigger for you the fact that as, as, as Fred's wife walked in and changed his experience, when you walk through the doorway, let it trigger for you that Jesus Christ is present in your reality, and if you let him, he'll change where you are too. Amen. Oh, now, come on. <laughs> See, that's what I'm afraid of. I'm afraid that we turn that off. I'm afraid that right now all you're looking for is when I say I'm done. Don't do that. Don't do that. Let what we're discovering about who Jesus is and how Jesus operates in life into that space so that he can remove the obstacles from where you are to all that God wants to be and do in your life. Repent.